In the last video, we trained a small three rows by five seats configuration. In this video, we're gonna train 10 rows by five seats. Since the configuration is more complicated, I'm gonna use factorized environment, which allows me to train multiple environments in parallel. Also, we'll look at the training progress in TensorBoard, which shows us the training status in graph format. Last time we were only training with one environment and if you were to look at your task manager during training, it was probably only using maybe 20 to 40% of your processing power. We want to make training more efficient by training multiple environments at the same time. Back to our training function, you can see that it's a little bit more sophisticated than last times, but it's still only a few lines long. Instead of using gym.make to create the instance of our environment, we're using the make factor environment function. And this is imported up here. What the make factor environment function will do is to make multiple instances of our environment so that we can run training on them all at once. Remember that our airplane environment, let me go there. In the init function, it takes in multiple parameters. The one that we are going to adjust is the number of rows. The way that we can adjust it is to pass in to the environment, KW arguments, the inputs that the init function expects. And the last parameter is the factor environment class. And there are two choices, dummy factor environment and subprocess factor environment. Here I'm using sub factor environment. What this does is to take advantage of Python's multiprocessing feature. In my example here, I'm gonna have 12 instances of my airplane environment running on different processes all at the same time. The other choice is to use dummy factor environment. Now it doesn't actually execute 12 environments in parallel. It actually executes them in sequential order. So for example, in environment one, it's gonna take one action and then it moves on to environment two, takes an action, and then it moves on to environment three, takes an action, and so on. Even though it's not using multiprocessing, it still provides some level of optimization. Now, why would you use dummy vector environment versus multi actual multiprocessing? That's because multiprocessing has overhead and not necessarily faster in all instances. If you have a simpler environment, sometimes dummy vector ENV is faster. So this is something that you have to try it out on your environment. Now, why did I choose 12? This depends on how much processing power you have. So just arbitrarily pick a number, run it. If it's eating up most of your processing power, then keep it. If not, then adjust. Moving on, we still have our maskable PPO model here. The stable baselines three PPO documentation actually says to run PPO on CPU. So instead of doing it on GPU, I'm changing the device to my CPU. And then when I start this training, I'm gonna show you TensorBoard. Now, let me hop down here for a moment. We're still calling our learn function and in the total time steps parameter, I'm passing a very big number here, which is the same as saying train indefinitely. This callback function, which calls my configuration up here. This callback configuration essentially says, based on my evaluation frequency, which I set to 10,000 here, every 10,000 training steps, take the current model, test it against the environment, and if the reward is better than last time, save the current model as the best model and save it under this path here, which is models slash maskable PPO. And let me back up what I just said. If I was to run one environment, then the evaluation frequency is every 10,000. And since I have it set to 12 environments, we actually have to do the math of 12 times 10,000, which is 120,000. So in this case, every 120,000 training steps, test the model against the environment and save it if it's the new best model. Now that we have a way to save the best model, how do we stop training? since we set the learn function to train almost indefinitely. Of course, we can always hit control C to cancel the execution. The other two ways to stop training is through the eval callback function. The first one here, this is triggered when there is a new best model. After an evaluation, when it detects a new best model, it's gonna trigger 
the stop training on reward threshold callback, which stops the training, but we have to pass it a threshold. In this environment, I don't know what the threshold is, so I can't use this. But if you are creating an environment where you know you have a certain target, then you can use this one to stop training. The next one is callback after eval. So immediately after an evaluation, this callback is triggered. And this one will stop training on no new model improvements. On the first parameter, we can set it to something like 5, which means if in 5 consecutive evaluations, there are no new improvements, this will stop training. However, to prevent premature stoppage, we can use the minimum evaluations parameter we can set minimum evaluations to something like 10 to make sure that 10 evaluations has passed before checking that there are no new improvements. At the moment, I'm not sure what values to set these to, so I'm just gonna do the good old fashioned control C to stop training. I'm gonna comment this out, I'm not gonna use it. And I will start training, make sure I'm calling the train function and I will hit F5. Training has started. If you're using VS Code, you might get a message like this that says it detects TensorBoard. Do you want to open TensorBoard in VS Code? I find that TensorBoard doesn't look as good in VS Code, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just launch it separately so I can go there with my browser. Now going back up, we're logging to the PPO number 18 folder. Let me go here, go to logs. These are my previous runs and right now I'm on PPO 18. I'm going to open a new terminal. Click on the plus sign here. In this new terminal, I'm going to type in tensorboard dash dash log directory equal to my logs folder. By the way, tensorboard comes with the stable baselines 3 installation. Okay, TensorBoard is active now. You can see that it has launched a local web server. I'm going to hold Control and I'm going to click this link. Okay, TensorBoard is up. It's showing all my logs here. I'm going to focus on the one I just started, which is 18. I will select it. What TensorBoard does is to take the logs, these logs that we reviewed last time, and it puts it in a graph form. Remember, roll well out our episodes. It's graphing our average episode length and average reward. And then when it does evaluations, it's going to start graphing the evaluations here. And let me make this color a little bit brighter. You remember the frames per second and all the PPO related logging. The one that we were looking at last time was average reward. We want to see the average reward go up. What I'm seeing here is average reward is actually went down and it's not really changing. So let me pause and I'll come back after a little while and see. Oh, while this is training, let me check my task manager. See if it's utilizing most of my CPU. It's using around 90% of my CPU. So this is a good sign that I have the right number of parallel environments set. Okay, it's been 400,000 time steps and our reward is not good. So that means something is wrong. The first thing I wanna check is my airplane environment and my reward function. I mean, my airplane environment, my reward function is set to the negative number of passengers stalled plus the number of passengers moving. This worked when we had the three rows by five seats environment, but maybe now that we have a 10 rows by five seats environment, there's always a lot of passengers that can still move and not enough that are stalled. So maybe I need to take this out of the reward function and only count or only penalize the number of passengers stalled. I'll come back and I'll start training again. This is going to create a new set of logs. It was 18 before, now on 19. You can see that TensorBoard automatically detected my run number 19. 
I'm going to deselect 18. Let me pause the video and uh, come back after a while. Okay, it's only been a minute and we can already see the difference. This is a good sign that the model is improving, unlike last time, which actually went down. And I'll pause again and I'll be right back. Okay, I started a new simulation number 22 and I left it running for uh, three hours, almost 20 million time steps. Let me expand this graph. We started at around minus 160. And then by the end, actually we can go up to the evaluation graph, expand this, and it's ending up at negative 18, which is a huge improvement, almost a 10x improvement. Now let's take a look at the simulation. First, let's look at the completely random one, which should get negative 160. And you should see that there's gonna be a lot of stop and go. And then we'll take a look at the trained one. Okay, this is the random simulation where we're just randomly picking passengers to send to the line. Notice all the stop and goes probably every few steps. The line stalls. And you can see the line is building up pretty long. A lot of stop and goes. Okay, let's wrap this up. Now this is the train one. There should be very little stop and goes. Oh, look at that. Everybody gets to sit down at the same time. You can see that most of the time, multiple people are sitting down at the same time. And the line is consistently short. That was a lot more organized than the untrained one. Join me in the next video where I don't know what we're going to talk about yet, but hope to see you there.